Hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Everyone is a good start to the week as we uh, prepare to end the year. Um, turn to your questions in just a moment, but first, we do have one element at the top, and that is today we announced the appointment of Joe Kennedy III as the U.S. Special Envoy to Northern Ireland for Economic Affairs. In his capacity, uh, Joe Kennedy will focus on advancing economic development and investment opportunities in Northern Ireland to the benefit of all communities, as well as strengthening people-to-people -people ties between the United States and Northern Ireland. His role builds on the longstanding U.S. commitment to supporting peace, prosperity, and stability in Northern Ireland and the peace dividends of the Belfast and Good Friday Agreement. Joe has, has dedicated his career to public service, including eight years in the U.S. House of Representatives, his tenure as Massachusetts Assistant District Attorney, and service as a Peace Corps volunteer. He will draw from his extensive experience to support economic growth in Northern Ireland and to deepen U.S. engagement with all communities. So with that, uh, I know uh, our colleague is out, so uh, happy to, Sean. Uh, sure, um, there's something else I wanted to ask about. Yeah, but just to follow up on, on Joe Kennedy, yep. um, just to uh, to clarify, this is not uh, a George Mitchell style position of um, Northern Ireland envoy. He's not gonna be dealing with post-Brexit issues directly. That, that's right. Uh, Mr. Kennedy's focus will be on strengthening uh, US economic engagement and people-to-people -people ties uh, with all communities in uh, Northern Ireland. He won't be involved in political issues, uh, including ongoing efforts to resolve differences over the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and to restore devolved institutions in Northern Ireland. That is something that, of course, we are uh, deeply focused on. Uh, our diplomats here in Washington, our diplomats in Europe as well, they'll uh, continue to engage all parties uh, on those particular issues. But uh, the economic side uh, of all of this is uh, critically important as well, and uh, Joe Kennedy will focus uh, on increasing those opportunities for communities in Northern Ireland uh, and strengthening those people's people ties. Sure. Uh, and just briefly, is there any plan to have that position as well? Is that defunct, essentially having a broader special envoy position? I, I don't have any additional uh, uh, personnel announcements to, to make now. Obviously, we're going to remain very engaged on the political side uh, of the equation, which will uh, complement uh, what uh, Joe Kennedy is doing on the economic side. But I don't have any further uh, personnel announcements at the time. Sure. Uh, could I move to uh, COP15? Sure. Um, there was an agreement announced. Can, can I ask on Joe okay. Kennedy? Is that, is that, uh, does that require Senate confirmation? I know it, uh, maybe I missed it. It does not. It does not. Okay, thanks. Uh, COP15, there was an agreement announced in early hours today. Um, do you have any broader uh, any broader reaction to that? How important is that, and particularly the role of China? China was uh, was, was was heading this, um, at least the diplomacy. Some people say this shows China stepping up its game diplomatically. How do you, how do you, see, do you see? Well, that? we were all uh, quite pleased to see uh, the good news that emanated from Montreal earlier today, uh, namely that the delegates to uh, COP15, the Convention on Biological Diversities, uh, COP15, adopted a sweeping and ambitious global biodiversity framework committing the world for the first time uh, to conserving or protecting 30% of global lands and waters by 2030. Uh, the global biodiversity framework is the turning point we think we need to combat uh, the biodiversity crisis and, and leave a better world for future generations. We're grateful uh, to the work of all of the delegates who were there, including uh, our uh, Special Envoy and uh, Assistant Secretary Monica Medina, uh, who led the U.S. delegation and uh, the U.S. team uh, that accompanied her there. Uh, we're really thrilled to see this. We see this as the culmination of uh, not only this COP, but really uh, years of efforts uh, with uh, the results being a framework that makes clear um, ambitious and measurable goals and targets uh, coupled uh, with review efforts uh, as well to track that progress. Uh, we look forward to working with all of our partners uh, to reach the global bio biodiversity frameworks 2030 targets. Of course, it's important to have targets, but it's arguably even more important to achieve those targets and to make sure the hard work that went into this framework is actually translated uh, into the concrete results uh, that we hope to see uh, in the coming year. Uh, achieving this, what is called a 30 by 30 target, uh, is not only uh, important for biodiversity, uh, but for also supporting nature's resilience and climate impacts and contributing to a sustainable and resilient uh, global economy. Uh, we are, the United States has, has long been a, a champion uh, for conservation globally. Uh, we know that we have to work with partners around the world to conserve critical ecosystems, to protect wildlife, uh, reduce the threats that nature uh, and nature preserves around the world uh, might face. And we are prepared uh, to 
uh, and we will continue to provide significant foreign assistance for biodiversity annually. Uh, and we will continue to be one of the largest donors uh, to the Global Environment Facility, the financial mechanism of this convention. Uh, I mentioned before that we were pleased to work uh, with all partners. Um, we will continue to work with all partners on these important and ambitious uh, biodiversity goals. Uh, we appreciate the PRC's partnership uh, with Canada in hosting the uh, convention in Montreal. Uh, and helping to ensure a successful conclusion uh, to this COP and uh, to us landing upon uh, this important framework. The PRC Minister of Ecology and Environment, Huang Rung uh, this individual served as the president of uh, the COP and presided over plenary sessions, including uh, the session earlier today uh, where the parties to the CBD reached agreements on the global biodiversity framework. We've long spoken of our approach to the PRC. It's an approach that, as you all know, is predicated largely on competition. There are obviously uh, areas of uh, no shortage of uh, tension in that relationship, but there are also areas where uh, we are prepared to, and frankly, we need uh, to work together. Climate is one of them. Global health uh, is one of them. Uh, other uh, global and transnational challenges, and that includes the threats to biodiversity uh, that this COP was uh, was focused on. Sure. Uh, just to expand on the, on the role of China, um, to what extent would you say the United States was cooperating with China on this? And do you, do you think this could be uh, this could be a sign for, for, for other areas, whether it's climate or whether it's even more uh, geopolitical security issues where there could be more cooperation with the Chinese? Well, I think there was a, a spirit of broad cooperation that really pervaded this uh, COP. I think you saw that in what was announced today. It was never inevitable that we would land upon such an ambitious framework, but uh, because of uh, cooperation and uh, concerted commitment on the part of uh, those participants, uh, we were able to do that. We certainly hope that uh, this spells deeper cooperation with the PRC uh, on shared challenges, uh, climate, biodiversity being two of them. Uh, when the PRC announced over the summer uh, a, a pause or a cessation in cooperation with the United States on climate and in other areas of, of shared mutual interest, uh, we expressed what I think countries around the world uh, were, in many cases, thinking to themselves, that as uh, two global powers, as uh, the world's first and second largest emitters, uh, we have uh, not only a need, but also a responsibility uh, to work together uh, when it comes to these shared challenges. The world expects that of us, uh, an inability or uh, perhaps even worse, an unwillingness uh, to work together on these shared challenges is not only bad for the United States, it's not only bad for the PRC, uh, but it is especially bad for the rest of the world, especially countries in the developing world, emerging partners of ours uh, that are especially acutely feeling the implications of climate change, uh, degradation of the economy, uh, reeling from uh, the world's, the, the toll uh, that is being taken on ecology uh, and climate uh, in their own, within their own territories and around the world. Uh, so I think not only we uh, hope that this will translate into additional areas of concrete, concrete cooperation between the United States and the PRC, but uh, the rest of the world. Uh, presumably uh, can I follow, to that as well. Can I follow up sure. PRC, China? China and Russia will conduct joint military exercises in the East China Sea from this week to next week. What do you see as the purpose of training? Well, I understand that these are annual drills that the PRC and Russia uh, take part in. I understand that these drills have been taking place for uh, about a decade or so. So while this is uh, not new, these particular uh, drills, we've uh, made no secret of our concern about uh, the relationship between China and the PRC, uh, the PRC's alignment, especially with Russia. Uh, as Moscow continues, it's brutal, it's unlawful uh, war against Ukraine. We've heard the PRC claim to be neutral in this conflict, but uh, its behavior, including uh, what we're seeing uh, here makes it clear it's still investing in close ties uh, with Russia. Uh, 
we have warned the PRC against uh, providing Russia military assistance or systematic um, help evading the sanctions that countries around the world have placed on Moscow as a result of its uh, brutal invasion of its peaceful neighbors. Uh, we are very closely monitoring uh, Beijing's activity uh, in this particular uh, realm, but more broadly, uh, the world is watching very closely to see uh, which countries stand up for the basic principles of freedom, of sovereignty, of self-determination, of independence that have not only been at the heart of the international system over the past eight decades, but uh, are really form the basis of uh, the UN system uh, and the UN Charter that some 200 countries around the world uh, have endorsed, have invested in, have helped to create uh, in the aftermath of uh, the Second World War. The PRC has tremendous sway uh, when it comes to Russia, uh, not only the partnership uh, that they have deepened in recent years, but uh, their economic ties, their political ties, their security ties. Uh, we and the rest of the world hope to see the PRC use that leverage constructively. Uh, there have been some instances where we have seen that and we welcome that. Uh, the statement from the PRC, the restatement, I should say, uh, of uh, the axiom that's been uh, around since the Cold War, that a nuclear war uh, can never be won and must never be fought. Uh, the restatement of that uh, we welcomed because it very clearly signaled uh, that countries around the world would not tolerate uh, the use of nuclear weapons and were tremendously concerned with even the irresponsible rhetoric that we had heard emanating from Russia. Uh, we certainly hope that the PRC uses its influence uh, to help bring about an end to uh, this brutal war, but steps like this um, those are those are not helpful. Uh, they do not move us any closer well, well, to that. Uh, last Sunday, in North Korea fired two mid-range ballistic missiles. Can you tell us specifically what type of missile it is? I, I'm not prepared to offer uh, a detailed assessment. These were ballistic missile launches. Uh, these were launches that, as we have said about other ballistic missile launches, uh, violate multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, we believe they pose a threat uh, to the region uh, and to the international community more broadly. Our commitments to uh, the defense of the ROK, the Republic of Korea, uh, as well as to Japan remain ironclad. Uh, and we remain committed uh, to doing all that we can uh, to make that clear, even as we seek to make clear to the DPRK that we harbor no hostile intent. Uh, that we are uh, committed to a diplomatic approach, and we continue to call on the DPRK uh, to meet us uh, in uh, our continued calls for practical, pragmatic diplomacy uh, to uh, address this challenge. A quick follow-up on PRC. I will shift to Ukraine after that. Will the PRC's behavior between now and next couple of weeks, uh, and also talks with upcoming talks with Putin, will those factor into the Secretary's trip? China. I am certain that uh, when the secretary travels to Beijing, which we still uh, expect to happen uh, at some point early next year, uh, that Russia's war against Ukraine will be on the agenda. Uh, Russia's war against Ukraine has been on the agenda since uh, well before uh, it started. Uh, the threat of Russian aggression uh, was on the agenda before February 24th when Secretary Blinken uh, spoke to his counterpart. Uh, you all recall as well that President Biden had uh, an opportunity to speak to uh, President Xi uh, from a distance um, before Russia's war actually started um, ever since February 24th. It has been high on the agenda as well, and our message uh, has been simple. Uh, we uh, hope and expect uh, the PRC will not uh, assist Moscow's efforts by providing security assistance or by helping Moscow evade sanctions uh, in a systematic way uh, that we'll be watching closely. and. Uh, more broadly, the entire world will be watching closely to see uh, where the PRC falls uh, on these issues that are near and dear uh, to countries around the world, the, the, the principles that are at the heart uh, of the UN Charter. So far, we have um, seen Moscow, attempt, or excuse me, seen Beijing uh, attempt to have it both ways uh, to some degree, but there is no having it both ways 
uh, when it comes to this particular issue. Uh, countries around the world, including uh, the United States, but um, countries in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere, will be looking to hear that the PRC actually believes and actually upholds uh, the principles that have been at uh, the heart of its foreign policy for decades now. Independence, territorial integrity, sovereignty. This is what the PRC has consistently uh, purported to stand up for uh, within the UN system, within the international system, uh, and countries around the world uh, will want to see that there's actually meaning there. Uh, that this actually means something to the PRC, and these are not just words. Thank you. I'll take on Ukraine. Um, back again to the uh, Kamikaze drones uh, on Ukraine. I want to focus on Kiev because you just tweeted a uh, Kafka observatory report on uh, Kiev falling into darkness. What does it tell you about Russia's war strategy? What new have we learned from this report? I guess with the report, thank you for posting it. But I didn't see anything about where the drones are coming from, Iran. Um, does uh, does this make Iranian, let's say, trainers in Donbass, in uh, Crimea, a legitimate target for Ukraine? So a, a couple a couple things in your question. First, about the strategy. Uh, what it tells us is that President Putin's strategy has failed. Uh, President Putin, prior to February 24th, uh, thought that he could deploy his forces, send them into Kiev, uh, and within uh, six hours or uh, at most six days, uh, essentially be in control of the country, be the de facto uh, leader of Ukraine, uh, attempting to topple the government in Kyiv, attempting to subdue the people uh, of Ukraine. Uh, of course, we are now nine, 10 months on from that. And it is patently clear uh, that President Putin's aims have failed. Uh, and so his strategy has shifted. Uh, his strategy has now become uh, one of acute brutality. Uh, it is a strategy that, as the Secretary has said, seeks to weaponize winter, going after infrastructure, going after what the people of Ukraine need to survive during the cold winter, uh, attempting to deprive them of heat, of water, of electricity, uh, of basic services. Meanwhile, just as President Putin's strategy has shifted, so too has ours. Uh, we are continuing to provide our Ukrainian partners with precisely what they need uh, to take on uh, the battle where it is being waged right now. But just as President Putin has taken his battle uh, to the cities of Ukraine, to civilian infrastructure targets, uh, we are providing our Ukrainian partners with what they need to defend those targets. Uh, with, a, with a heavy emphasis on air defense systems. Uh, from the earliest days of this war, we provided uh, stingers uh, and other air defense systems. Of course, uh, now uh, in more recent months, we provided uh, more sophisticated and capable systems capable of protecting energy infrastructure and the targets that Moscow is pursuing, including the NASAMs uh, that we've spoken about uh, to some degree. You raise the issue of uh, Iran's provision of UAVs uh, to Russia. It's clear that these UAVs are being used uh, to uh, deadly and lethal effect, even when they're not lethal, when they may not be lethal in the first instance through the attack. Their, their intent uh, is to inflict uh, suffering and ultimately death by depriving the Ukrainian people of heat, of water, of electricity. Uh, during the winter. Uh, our Ukrainian partners have been effective in taking on uh, a good number uh, of these drones in, in the course of any particular onslaught. Uh, they've, uh, in some cases, been able to shoot down uh, more than half uh, of these drones. But the fact that a single drone is able to uh, evade uh, air defense systems and inflict such damage and brutality uh, to us is just a reminder of the stakes. It's a reminder of uh, these barbaric tactics uh, that President Putin and his enablers, uh, including his enablers in Tehran, uh, are, are assisting. Uh, right now, to, to your question, the battle is raging in, uh, in the south, in the east, 
uh, in the North as well. We are providing our Ukrainian partners uh, with what they need to continue to be successful. And they have been uh, successful in that counteroffensive. Uh, we, Secretary Blinken, was last in uh, Kyiv in September of this year. Uh, at that time, it was just a few hours uh, prior to his arrival. Uh, when the counteroffensive had begun, we received a briefing from the country team and our uh, embassy in Kyiv, uh, and later that day received a briefing from President Zelensky and his team. Uh, at the time, I think, they had uh, moved 40 kilometers past the front lines, uh, and now it's just remarkable uh, to look at the effectiveness of the counteroffensive, uh, the, the square mileage, the thousands of square miles uh, that our Ukrainian partners have wrested back uh, from Russian occupiers, bringing uh, the fight to uh, territory that Moscow has attempted to annex, attempt to subsume, uh, attempted to occupy, uh, of course, with uh, results that speak for themselves. Does so Ukraine have a right, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine. Have a right to target Iranian, as, as before, Iranian targets, or Russia's as, as well, in Donbass, in uh, Crimea, when it hits back by using the, the U.S. weapons? We, uh, Ukraine has a right to defend its territory, uh, and any target on sovereign Ukrainian territory uh, is by definition self-defense. I just follow up uh, on this issue. Uh, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger uh, called for negotiation to begin. And he said that the only outcome is to negotiate settlement. A call that uh, was dismissed by Kiev. They called it appeasing the aggressor and so on. Do you think that his call is appeasing the aggressor? Well, Mr. Kissinger was speaking of a private citizen. I'm, I'm uh, often hesitant, uh, always hesitant, I should say. Uh, to characterize the views of private citizens. I, I won't do it here except to say uh, we firmly believe that Ukraine and only Ukraine has the right to decide its future. Uh, we believe, as does President Zelensky, that this war will have to end eventually through dialogue and diplomacy. President Zelensky himself has laid out a vision for uh, a just peace. We believe in the need for a peace that is both just and durable. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen any meaningful reciprocation from Moscow. I made this point before, but just as President Zelensky was outlining his vision of a just peace for world leaders who were gathered in Bali in November, uh, it was met within hours by another brutal assault by uh, Russian drones, missiles, bombs falling down uh, on infrastructure targets, a continued escalation of this phase of the conflict that began in October uh, and that continues today, continues uh, even within uh, recent hours. Can I move on to another topic? Sure, anything else on Russia? Ukraine. Ukraine. On Ukraine, Ukraine. sure. Yes, uh, according to some reports, uh, you ask uh, Greece uh, to send uh, this uh, 300 uh, to Ukraine, and Greece accepted your proposal. Um, in this case, are, are you prepared to give to the Greeks uh, some patriots? Well, we always defer to individual countries when it, can, when it comes to any uh, contributions that uh, they may be or are making to uh, Ukraine's self-defense. But um, we certainly uh, recognize the profound threat that Ukraine faces from the air. Uh, our NATO allies, uh, Greece, of course, included, uh, recognize that as well. It's always a topic of discussion when we speak to our Ukrainian partners uh, regarding what they need to protect uh, their people, to protect their country from the air. It was a target, excuse me, it was a topic of discussion in Bucharest uh, at the NATO ministerial uh, late last month. And so we're continuing to look at ways together with our allies and partners uh, to best and most effectively help Ukraine protect its people, protect its uh, population, to protect uh, its broader infrastructure from these sorts of attacks. Uh, each country is going to have to decide for itself what it is able and to prepare and prepared uh, to provide to Ukraine. Uh, we certainly appreciate the many ways the international community, including Greece, uh, has uh, demonstrated their support and has uh, stepped up. Uh, there have been times, uh, and sometimes we pointed to these publicly. You may remember that in the early days uh, of this conflict, uh, Slovakia. Uh, made the decision to provide an S-300 air defense system to Ukraine, uh, we were able to help support, to facilitate uh, that contribution by uh, backfilling uh, Slovakia's needs. There are some cases where countries do this, and uh, we don't talk about it uh, as publicly. But we are looking at ways, uh, whether it is through directly providing security assistance to Ukraine, 
the some $20 billion uh, that we've provided since uh, the start uh, of this administration, or in some cases, what we can do, what we can provide to other countries so they in turn uh, can provide their wares uh, and their supplies uh, to Ukraine. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Moving to the Palestinian issue. Uh, in a lengthy interview with uh, our uh, Ambassador Knight reiterated that the U.S. is intent on reopening the, the consulate in Ukraine. Question to you is when? I mean, you know, it's been a couple of years. What, what are the obstacles for reopening the consulate? Well, he reiterated that commitment because we are, in fact, uh, intent on following through on it. We are committed uh, to, reop to reopening our consulate general in Jerusalem. Uh, we continue to believe that reopening this facility would put the United States in the best position to engage uh, and uh, engage with and provide support to uh, the Palestinian people. And we'll continue to discuss this issue with our uh, Palestinian and Israeli partners and we'll continue to consult with Congress on it as well. Uh, even as we are working to fulfill uh, this commitment that you've heard from the Secretary, that you've heard from the President and others, uh, we have a dedicated team of colleagues working in Jerusalem in our Office of Palestinian Affairs. Uh, they're focused on engagement with um, uh, an outreach to the Palestinians day in, day out. A uh, quick uh, related issue. Uh, the Israelis uh, deported a Palestinian human rights lawyer uh, Salah Hamouri, yes, he is a, a uh, French citizen. But are you alarmed that this, they may use this, considering it was done by the Minister of the Interior or the Minister of the Interior and so on, that this will set a precedent for deporting Jerusalemites? Are you concerned about this issue? So uh, a couple things on this. Uh, we have heard the statements from the Israeli government that this was a decision uh, made out of concern for Israel's security. Uh, we are not in a position to assess uh, this claim, uh, uh, but we would refer you to the government of Israel for more information regarding, regarding their stated basis uh, for this actions, for this action. Uh, for our part, we of course recognize uh, the very real security challenges facing Israel, and we've uh, reiterated our commitment to uh, Israel's uh, security. It is in fact ironclad. Uh, however, uh, we have concerns about the practice of deportation and revocation of residency and the potential threat uh, of such policies on the demographic character uh, of Jerusalem. Uh, to your question uh, regarding any broader implications uh, of this beyond this discrete situation, uh, we of course uh, have serious concerns uh, about any broader practice of revocation of residency and deportation from uh, East Jerusalem, but I would hasten to add that uh, does not appear to be uh, what is happening. And lastly, last week you expressed concern and called on the Israelis for investigating the killing of 16-year-old Jenna Zakarna. Have you heard anything from the Israelis on this issue? Uh, we, did, uh, we, we did express our uh, condolences to the family of uh, Jenna uh, Zakaria. Uh, we uh, noted that the IDF uh, had put out a statement. Prime Minister Bennett uh, had issued uh, a statement as well. Uh, we know that they're undertaking a review. We certainly hope to see uh, that review culminate in uh, accountability. Uh, we've raised uh, the issue ourselves. It's not for us to speak to uh, what we've heard uh, privately from our Israeli partners, uh, but our expression of condolence and uh, the uh, hope and expectation that this investigation will end in accountability stance. Yes, please. You, you were surprised, uh, three questions. One is that about uh, Tom Westrep and Yapti, because he met uh, with Afghan delegation, including uh, former President Karzai. And number two, there was a report today that uh, Moscow invited uh, Ahmad Massoud and also Defense Acting Minister uh, Yaqub, Mullah Yaqub, uh, any comment about that? And also Taliban beating women in front of the people in northern Afghanistan, very bad. You know, it's kind of insultation. Any comment about that? Uh, thanks, Nazira. So first on, on Tom West's uh, recent trip to uh, the UAE, to Japan, to India, uh, we talked about this, I believe it was last week. Um, this was uh, a trip to meet with government counterparts, to meet with media and civil society, 
uh, as well as business leaders and communities with ties uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, he, uh, throughout the trip, but especially in the UAE, uh, discussed shared interests in Afghanistan with our Emirati counterparts, uh, including, as we always do, uh, the rights of the people of Afghanistan, its women, its minorities uh, of, of all types. Uh, of all types, uh, the rights of women and girls to education, the need for economic stabilization, uh, our uh, focus on security challenges and the imperative of uh, seeing to it that Afghanistan does not again become a safe haven for international terrorism, all uh, with the uh, focus on our humanitarian support to the people of Afghanistan. As we always do, uh, Tom West engaged with a range of uh, stakeholders. Uh, he did meet with Hamid Karzai. He met with former Balk Governor Atta uh, as well when he was in the UAE. Uh, we think it's important that we hear from a wide range of voices representing the Afghan people and Afghan perspectives. Uh, that is something we do here in this country when it comes to the Afghan diaspora, uh, but it's something that we do uh, around the world, uh, and especially in the Gulf, uh, where we have an ability to hear from uh, Afghans who uh, spend significance or all of their time inside uh, Afghanistan. We think that perspective is uh, important. Um, I'm not going to speak to uh, Russian engagement uh, with other uh, act uh, Afghan actors or, or voices, uh, but to reiterate that uh, just as we engage with stakeholders uh, from across Afghan society, we think it's important that the international community uh, hear from stakeholders uh, from across the international, uh, across the Afghan, um, uh, the, who are representative uh, of the Afghan people. The, what we've seen, the images we've seen out of Afghanistan, uh, the floggings, the public executions, uh, the clear, blatant, violent, barbaric uh, violations of human rights, uh, of course, are of grave concern to all of us. Uh, they harken back to a prior era, uh, to an era that no Afghan or Afghans certainly as a whole uh, do not want to return to uh, an Afghan an Afghanistan that lacked opportunity, that lacked stability, uh, that lacked security, that certainly lacked prosperity. In every engagement we have with the Taliban, human rights is at the top of the agenda. Uh, we, of course, not only remind them of the commitments they have made to the United States, but more importantly, of the commitment they have to the people of Afghanistan uh, to uphold. Uh, their basic and fundamental and universal rights, uh, something that the Taliban have failed to do. Uh, just as it, as it is a topic with uh, the Taliban themselves and our limited engagements with them, uh, we spend much more time uh, consulting with partners from around the world. This is precisely what Tom West was doing in the UAE, in Japan, and in India as well. It's precisely what we do with the UN. Rina and Miri, our special envoy for uh, Afghan women and girls, uh, was recently in Indonesia, uh, where she represented the United States at the International Conference for Afghan Women's Education uh, that was co-hosted by Indonesia and Qatar. In every potential, uh, in every forum, uh, we take advantage uh, of our presence to press the case for the human rights of the Afghan people and uh, to press the case for ways in which we can hold the Taliban accountable for their failure to uphold these commitments. But Taliban never listen. They don't fix themselves, and instead of they fix them themselves, they make an insult, more insultation for women. And also Afghan people, they are very upset. They say they receive 40, more than $40 million every week, and United States doesn't have any influences to the Taliban. Hey, respect women, otherwise we make a sanction on you. Well, the Taliban remains heavily sanctioned, of course, uh, and we are not prepared to improve our relationship with the Taliban until and unless uh, they actually start to uphold the commitments they've made to the Afghan people. Uh, we will look at additional accountability measures, including sanctions, uh, if it comes to that. Uh, the other important point, though, Nazira, is that we're not uh, providing funding directly to the Taliban. Uh, we are providing hundreds of millions of dollars directly to the Afghan people, very intentionally bypassing uh, the Taliban to see to it uh, that the humanitarian funding, the funding that's provided by the American people doesn't pass through their coffers 
uh, doesn't, uh, isn't diverted uh, to their wallets and bank accounts, but instead uh, gets to the Afghan people where they need it most. Uh, the same is true of the Afghan fund, uh, the fund that the United States has established with the support of partners in the international community, the $3.5 billion uh, that is provided for Afghanistan's macroeconomic needs. Uh, that too, uh, there are rigorous uh, checks on that funding and any potential disbursements from that funding uh, to see to it uh, that uh, there isn't diversion uh, to the Taliban. Thanks, uh, Let me Thank move you. around a bit. bit. Yes. Uh, just to follow up on Nazira's question, I'm sure you have heard former Secretary Hillary Clinton talk about Ashraf Ghani uh, running away with stashes of money to UAE. That money belonged to the American people. Is there ever going to be something to recover that money from uh, people like Ashraf Ghani and many others who uh, I have personally reported on as well, and several other journalists as well, that there are officials or contractors that in these last 20 years, they uh, looted the U.S. government and kept their money over there in the U.A. Is the State Department ever going to take action uh, about them? I'm not in the position to speak to any specific claims, but what I can say is that the Afghan economy and the Afghan state more broadly uh, has long been plagued by corruption. Uh, it, of course, was a challenge prior to August of last year. Uh, it, of course, remains a challenge uh, with uh, the Taliban now, at least, in de facto control. Uh, there, are, uh, there was a focus that the United States had uh, with the prior Afghan government on anti-corruption. Uh, there were, uh, we uh, provided a, a good deal of support uh, to the prior Afghan government to help them uh, with this challenge, to uh, see to it that uh, the prior Afghan government were, uh, was effective, an effective steward uh, of the uh, revenues that it collected from the Afghan people. Uh, of course, uh, those types of programs are, uh, in, uh, are no longer possible uh, with the Taliban now in at least de facto control. Uh, across Afghanistan, but uh, we will continue with international partners uh, to do what we can uh, to make sure that uh, what is rightfully, what rightfully belongs to the people of Afghanistan uh, is or remains in the hands uh, of the people of Afghanistan. And that uh, one question, uh, just like Nazira said, in Afghanistan you see the human rights violation getting increased day by day. Uh, in Pakistan, I don't know if you are aware, since last just even two days, yesterday, one police station was attacked and four police officers were killed. Right now, there is a counter-terrorism department which is under siege right now by the Taliban, by the TTP. So do you see in coming days uh, any over the horizon or under the horizon drones coming back to the region and targeting these terrorist groups? or? Uh, situation has not gotten that worse yet? Well, well first, on uh, the ongoing situation uh, in uh, Pakistan, uh, we are, of course, aware, we've been closely following reports that militants have seized control of the counterterrorism uh, center in, in Banu. Uh, we offer our deepest sympathies to those injured. Uh, we urge those responsible for the attack to cease all acts of violence, to safely release those who remain hostage, and to end the seizure of the counterterrorism center. Uh, of course, we refer you to the government in Pakistan for uh, details on this ongoing situation, but the broader point is uh, that the government of, of Pakistan uh, is a, a partner uh, when it comes to these uh, shared challenges, including the challenge of uh, terrorist groups, uh, terrorist groups inside of Afghanistan, terrorist groups along the Afghan-Pakistan uh, border. Uh, we uh, have partnered with our Pakistani friends to uh, take on, uh, to help them uh, take on this challenge. We stand ready uh, to assist, uh, whether with this unfolding situation or uh, more broadly, but um, this is a situation for which we'd have to refer you to uh, Pakistani authorities. Just last one. Um, two days ago, Pakistani uh, foreign minister uh, has called the Indian prime minister butcher of Gujarat in New York. Um, Ironically, I had asked the same question six years ago to Mr. Kirby when for the first time uh, Mr. Modi was coming to the U.S. I had said that, uh, you know, Modi was not getting a U.S. visa now. Is he going to be allowed to come to the U.S.? All these years down the line, don't you think the strategic partnership with India has uh, 
kind of influence in some ways the human rights things with the U.S. stands for uh, minority rights, like Modi has been uh, treating the way Muslims are being treated uh, since last few years, you know. Former Prime Minister, even uh, Mr. Singh, had tweeted about it. Uh, uh, same thing with Ukraine. When you look at it, you know they are still uh, supplying, uh, buying large number of oil from Russia and India. But this strategic alliance uh, uh, it seems like it has influence, or it is at least portraying the U.S. image as it is forcing U.S. to compromise on some of its human rights, uh, uh, you know, things that the U.S. basically stands for. We have a global strategic partnership with India. Uh, I've just spoken to uh, the depth of our partnership with Pakistan. These relationships stand on their own. It is not zero sum. Uh, we see uh, the importance, the indispensability, really, uh, of maintaining uh, valuable partnerships with uh, both our Indian and our uh, Pakistani, uh, our Pakistani friends. Uh, each of these relationships. Uh, is we don't view them in relation to the other. Uh, each of these relationships uh, also happens to be multifaceted. Uh, so even as we deepen our global strategic partnership uh, with India, uh, we are uh, also have we also have a relationship uh, in which we can be uh, candid and frank uh, with one another, where we have uh, disagreements or concerns. Uh, we voice those just as we would with our Pakistani friends as well. Yes. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. We'll go ahead. Uh, just going back, uh, as far as U.S.-India diplomacy and relations are concerned, Secretary Blinken is his household name in India because of U.S.-India relations and also diplomacy between the two countries. Uh, one, I'd like to uh, have comments that to what you think of, or what President, uh, Prime Minister, I mean, Secretary Blinken thinks about U.S.-India relations, but also at the same time last week, as my friend said, at the United Nations Security Council, heated argument took place between the two countries, between the India and Pakistan, also between the two foreign ministers, India and Pakistan, blaming to each other. Indian foreign minister said that about terrorism, Pakistan is supporting terrorism, and then Pakistani foreign minister said so and so and so, I mean, butcher and calling names to Prime Minister Modi. And I think. Uh, uh, Foreign Minister Balal is, will be here in Washington tomorrow, or he's already here and speaking, have uh, many engagements. My question is, he called names to Prime Minister Modi and back home in Pakistan, uh, his uh, minister called, uh, threatened India with uh, nuclear weapons, that we have nuclear weapons and we, they are not just to show them off and we can use them. What I'm asking you, when Secretary Blinken is engaged with both countries. So what do you think now, and what, what do you think about this, and now he's going to engage with many regional countries when he visit on that. Situation is very heated up between India and Pakistan also back home. So where do we stand now? As for the U.S. concern, sorry. So uh, a couple things. Number one, uh, we have, as I said before, a global strategic partnership uh, with India. Uh, I have also spoken about the deep partnership we have uh, with Pakistan. These relationships in our mind are not zero sum. Uh, we don't view them in relation to one another. Uh, each of them is indispensable to us uh, and to the, sh the promotion and the pursuit of the shared goals, uh, the shared goals that we have with India, the shared goals that we have with Pakistan, uh, the shared goals that all three of us uh, share. The fact that we have partnerships with both countries uh, makes us uh, of course, uh, leaves us not wanting to see uh, a war of words between India and Pakistan. Uh, we would like to see constructive dialogue uh, between India and Pakistan. Uh, we think that is uh, for the betterment of the Pakistani people, for uh, the Indian people. Uh, there is much work that uh, we can do together bilaterally. Uh, there are differences that, uh, of course, uh, need to be addressed uh, between India uh, and Pakistan, the United States stands ready to assist as a, as a partner to both. I just follow one quickly. Uh, I did ask that question the other day. Mr. Patel was very nice and kind during the briefing. Uh, but, uh, if I can ask again a uh, question, how seriously Secretary Blinken is taking the comments of Prime Minister Modi that he told to 
uh, President Putin to end the war and this is not the time to play games or military use and all that. And what role you think or secretary think that uh, Prime Minister Modi or India can play to end the war between Russia and India, I mean Russia and uh, Ukraine, uh, superpower invading a smallest or tiniest country, Ukraine? Well, countries the world over uh, welcomed what we heard from Prime Minister Modi about this not being the era of war. Uh, I think it's notable that uh, the communique uh, emanating from the G20 uh, also had uh, very similar language, I think a testament to the fact that this was language and this was a call that resonated uh, in this country, uh, in South Asia, uh, in Europe, and around the world. The United States certainly welcomes it. Uh, it's also important because uh, India has a relationship with Russia that the United States does not have. Uh, for decades, uh, India, I should say Russia, was uh, prepared to be a partner to India in a way that the United States at the time was not. Uh, of course, that has changed in recent decades. Uh, it is uh, a bipartisan legacy of the last several administrations, perhaps starting most notably with the administration of President George W. Bush, uh, that the United States is now uh, a partner of, we hope, first resort uh, for India. Uh, there is a lot of good that we can do together, uh, not only for our two countries, but around the world. And I think we'll see a good example of that uh, in the coming year when India hosts the G20. Uh, I know we'll have an opportunity to uh, travel to India, to be in close touch uh, with India in the context uh, of the G20, uh, and we'll be able to see uh, what cooperation between our two countries uh, and a broader set of countries can uh, uh, can provide. Yes, Ian. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving over to China, I'm just wondering, is there anything, uh, given the, the pace and scale of their, of their COVID outbreak at the moment, I'm wondering if there's anything you can share about the department's assessment of of how that outbreak is going, how it's likely to, to spread, and any impact you can see. And I'm also wondering, um, is the U.S. concerned that China might not be being fully transparent about, about the COVID numbers, the cases, and, and also the deaths that we're seeing uh, in China right now? Uh, so uh, a few things on this. Um, first, uh, you know, we're not an epidemi epidemiological agency. I can barely pronounce the word, so uh, I am not going to uh, uh, be in a position to offer um, uh, those sorts of, of figures from here, we would need to refer you elsewhere for those. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the current outbreak uh, in China, um, we want to um, we want to see this addressed. We hope uh, our Chinese partners, uh, the Chinese, are are able to address it, and we hope for uh, several reasons. First and foremost, uh, anytime there is. Uh, death and illness anywhere around the world. Uh, we want to see uh, a situation like that uh, come to an end. Uh, when it comes to COVID, secondly, we know that anytime the virus is uh, spreading, uh, that it is um, uh, in the wilds, that it has the potential to mutate uh, and to uh, pose a threat to people everywhere. Uh, we've seen that over the course of uh, many different uh, um, permutations of, of this virus and, and certainly uh, another reason why uh, we are so focused on helping countries around the world uh, address uh, COVID, and another reason why um, bringing this to a close in, in China would be beneficial. But third, um, the toll of the virus uh, is of uh, concern to uh, the rest of the world, uh, given the size of uh, China's GDP, given the size of China's economy. Uh, it's not only uh, good for China uh, to be in a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis COVID, but uh, it's good for uh, the rest of the world as well. Um, we, uh, the United States continues to be a leading force uh, for countries around the world in the provision of uh, vaccines and helping countries uh, overcome uh, the acute phase uh, of the virus. Uh, we certainly hope uh, that will be the case uh, before long in the PRC as well. Yes. I have another question. According to reports, uh, Germany hosted a private meeting in Brussels uh, between the top advisors of the Prime Minister of Greece and the President of Turkey. Uh, they discuss, as we understand, the reapproachment of the two countries. Can you give us a comment on this? Do you have anything to say? I, I don't. I would need to refer you to Germany for, for comments on that, Sean. Um, I know we discussed Ukraine already, but could you um, could you say anything about Putin's trip to uh, President Putin's trip to uh, to Belarus? 
Um, a couple of things there. First of all, there's been some talk about whether uh, Russia will try to get a more direct Belarusian role in, um, in, in the war in Ukraine. Um, also, Putin just, just a while ago made some remarks saying that uh, Russia has no intention of absorbing uh, Belarus. And saying, Why could anybody think that? Uh, do you have any reaction to that? Uh, sure, I, I did see that headline just as I was coming down here. Uh, the reported claim from President Putin that he has no intention of, as you said, absorbing anyone uh, uh, in his uh, talks with President with uh, with uh, Lukashenko. Uh, look, I think a, a statement like that uh, has to be treated as the height of irony, uh, coming from uh, a leader who is seeking, at the present moment, right now, uh, to violently absorb uh, his other uh, peaceful next door neighbor. Uh, we've heard these statements from uh, President Putin uh, at the same time since uh, the earliest days of this conflict and in the weeks preceding this conflict. Uh, we have seen the Lukashenko regime essentially cede uh, its sovereignty, cede its independence uh, to Russia. We saw Russian forces mass inside uh, what should have been a sovereign Belarusian territory. Uh, we've seen attacks launched from what should be uh, sovereign Belarusian territory. Uh, and now uh, we hear these comments from President Putin and from Lukashenko. Uh, but I think the track record speaks much louder um, than anything these two leaders could say. Jordan, Same topic. Uh, let, let me move around to people I haven't topic. called on. Uh, yes. Thank you. Going back to North Korea. Uh, last month, during the summit meeting between United States, ROK, and Japan, they agreed to share the uh, DPRK missile warning data in the real time. So uh, I'm wondering if whether uh, this activity has been working effectively uh, each time when DPRK launched its missile, including yesterday. Well, what I can say is that uh, we are in nearly constant communication with our Japanese uh, and ROK allies. Uh, that is certainly true in the aftermath of uh, DPRK provocations. Uh, we are in communication from the State Department. We're in communication from the Defense Department, uh, from elsewhere uh, in uh, this administration as well. But as for the technical details of uh, any uh, early warning systems, I would have to refer you to the Department of Defense. Yes. Thank you so much, John Zaveri from Airway News in Pakistan. Um, the UK Taliban Pakistan launched massive attacks against Pakistani security forces and uh, uh, Pakistani civilians, as you recently talked about in the current situation right now in Bangu. Um, what kind of assistance you can offer to Pakistan uh, to crush this terrorist group? Because uh, we have seen that the United States has the ability to track down these ter terrorist groups and uh, wipe them out, like we see Al Qaeda's uh, leadership. So, what kind of assistance you can offer to Pakistan to crush this particular uh, about Pakistan? Well, of course, Pakistan is an important security partner. Uh, there are groups that are present in Afghanistan, in the Afghan-Pakistan border region that present a clear threat, uh, as we're seeing uh, not only to Pakistan, but potentially to uh, 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 countries uh, and people beyond. Uh, so we're in regular dialogue with our Pakistani partners. Uh, we are prepared uh, to help them uh, uh, take on the threats uh, they face, but I think the details of that cooperation are, are best left in, uh, in diplomatic channels. You just spoke about Pakistan and India. It's just not uh, about the wall. Where, where are tensions on the border? Where are tensions on the leadership of border countries? What kind of message do you give to the leadership of border countries to bring peace to the region? I'm sorry, what kind of message, message? you will give to the leadership of border countries to bring peace to the region? Well, I, I think the message is just as I related to your colleague. Um, uh, both. Pakistan and India uh, are partners of the United States. As with any of our partners, we want to see uh, constructive uh, relations between them. Uh, it's always of concern when we see uh, escalation in tensions, when we see escalation uh, in uh, words and dialogue. Uh, we want to see countries, certainly we want to see our partners uh, work together to achieve common ends. So the main reason of tensions between two countries is the uh, Indian occupied Kashmir, you know about it, former president, uh, from offer the role of mediation uh, between India and Pakistan to solve the issue of Kashmir. What is the uh, policy of current administration uh, on Kashmir? Our, our policy is that this is an issue that needs to be addressed by India and Pakistan. Uh, we are prepared to support uh, if the parties uh, want that, but this is a question for India and Pakistan to adjudicate. Yes. Jordan, question. Uh, let me let me go back to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, 
begin it. I have two questions. One is about a session today at the Security Council um, on the implementation of the resolution 202031. Uh, Mr. Guterres' report is already out, and we know that he decided at the moment he's not going to uh, raise the issue whether um, Islamic Republic's drone sale to Russia is against 2231 or it's not against that. He only mentioned two times that is under study. They are still gathering information and he's going to um, talk about it later. So what is your response to that? Because um, you, and along with European allies, you are pushing that this is against 2231. So how are you going to respond to that? Well, before this briefing started, at least the report was not out. It may have come out uh, during the course of the past hour. I understand that there's going to be a session at the UN Security Council in the three o'clock hour today. I have not seen the report if it is in fact out yet. So I'll reserve judgment until we have a chance to uh, take a look at it. But uh, as we said previously, uh, Russia's acquisition of UAVs from Iran uh, contravenes uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2231 and particularly the restrictions that resolution places on the transfer of missile related technology to or from Iran. Uh, it was adopted in July of 2015. Uh, it uh, established critical restrictions on Iran that would last for uh, a period of years. And all council members, including of course, Rukta, and as a permanent member of the Security Council, voted for it. Uh, Rukta was itself involved in negotiating the provisions of 2231. Uh, Iran, meanwhile, in violation of UN Security Council Resolution 2231, provided Russia with drones, uh, which Moscow is now using to wreak havoc and inflict destruction on Ukrainian civilians. We have provided uh, information regarding that. Uh, that has been provided publicly. It's provided. Uh, it's been provided within uh, the UN system as well. Uh, Russia, in violation of 2231, for its part, then procured them. Uh, there is no doubt that the transfer occurred without advance case-by-case -case approval by the council, and it is thus uh, a violation of Resolution 2231. We, uh, along with our partners, reported these violations to the UN Security Council in accordance uh, with the procedures set forth in UN Security Council Resolution 2231, uh, and uh, the UN Secretary is mandated under this very resolution uh, to investigate allegations of violations of this resolution, uh, typically following reports by member states, which in fact uh, uh, happened, the reports of violations. Uh, there is ample precedent for the UN Secretariat to carry out independent investigations as part of this mandate uh, to report on implementation. Uh, and as we've said before, we encourage the Secretariat to proceed with documenting and analyzing uh, information regarding uh, this violation. Um, I have another question on the freedom of internet, free internet for Iranian people. You gave out a statement today, a very clear, very long, transparent um, statement, uh, which is very clear. But my question is about the result of that group of experts that uh, the U.S. formed with um, European Council. Um, do you think, based on the current report that you have, or the upcoming reports, is there any possibility of U.S. and European allies to form like a joint plan of actions for Iranian people to support their access to free internet based on the reports that's coming from that group? Well, the United States uh, and many of our partners around the world, including our partners in Europe, uh, have taken uh, individual steps uh, to help facilitate uh, the ability of the Iranian people to communicate with one another and with the outside world. For our part, uh, we've spoken of the issuance of General License D2, uh, which uh, provides uh, technology companies the ability to uh, send hardware and software uh, that's needed by the Iranian people uh, to Iran on a self-executing basis. That is to say, they don't need approval from uh, the Department of the Treasury to, to do so. Uh, if there are steps that we can uh, take, relevant steps that we can take with our uh, European partners, we'll of course look at those. Uh, but we encourage countries around the world uh, to stand with uh, those brave protesters in Iran who are uh, expressing rights that are as universal to them as they are to people uh, around the world. It is always the policy of the United States to stand on the side of those exercising uh, their rights peacefully. We're doing that here. 
Uh, we've encouraged countries around the world uh, to do the same, and we'll work with countries uh, around the world to do the same. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, yesterday you called Tunisia's parliamentary elections an initial step. Um, how can an election with the lower voters, voter turnout in Tunisia's recent history um, for a parliament that will be you know, mostly toothless, how is that not considered a step back for Tunisia's democracy? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, you heard this from Secretary Blinken last week when he met with uh, President Saeed, and he said this publicly, we, we stand uh, with the Tunisian people. We remain committed uh, to the longstanding U.S.-Tunisia uh, partnership. Uh, we did note in the statement yesterday the parliamentary elections that took place uh, in Tunisia over uh, the weekend have, a, have the potential uh, to uh, put the country um, back on a path uh, put it back uh, towards a democratic trajectory. But uh, I think we have to be uh, candid that elections alone do not uh, a, mock a democracy make. Uh, the What you pointed to, of course, uh, is an apparent sign of discontent uh, among the Tunisian people. We were also uh, very clear about that. The low voter turnout uh, reflects the need for the government of Tunisia to engage in a more inclusive and uh, um, to get in a, in a more inclusive uh, process going forward to further expand political participation. And we'll continue to support the Tunisian people's aspirations for democratic and accountable government that protects free expression, including dissent, uh, and to uh, support civil society. Uh, we also, at the same time, urge the Tunisian government to take urgent steps to address the current economic crisis and achieve long-term stability and prosperity uh, for all Tunisians. Yes, Jen. Sorry to backtrack a bit to Belarus, but on the prospect of increased military aid from that country to Russia, does the State Department assess that could be a difference maker in Ukraine? And is the State Department trying to do anything to counter uh, any burgeoning uh, help that Putin might get on the battlefield? Well, we're going to continue to watch very closely. And the fact that we've watched very closely uh, has led us to see very clearly uh, the level of complicity, the level of cooperation uh, between the Lukashenko regime and uh, the Kremlin. That's why uh, the Lukashenko regime is now subject uh, to a bevy of sanctions. We'll look for additional means uh, to hold Belarus accountable uh, if it continues to cooperate with uh, the Kremlin in this in this um, in this brutal war. Um, remind me of the second. The other part of your question? Uh, whether or not it might be a difference maker in Ukraine. In, look, um, we're going to continue to watch very closely. Uh, we have seen President Putin's aims thwarted at every step of the way. Uh, he initially, as I said before, uh, thought that the country would effectively be his uh, within hours or days of February 24th. That, of course, turned out not to be the case. Uh, he called upon a partial mobilization, uh, mobilizing up to several hundred thousand uh, Russians, putting them into combat. That has turned out not to be a difference maker. Uh, he has turned to Iran, uh, potentially turned uh, elsewhere, including the DPRK, uh, for security assistance and supplies to use against the Ukrainian people. Uh, that has turned out not to shift the overall tide of battle, even as they inflict tremendous damage uh, across Ukraine. Uh, as he has changed his tactics, I think we've seen time and again that uh, his aims, even if they have become uh, narrower uh, and smaller, uh, they've been thwarted. And so regardless of what he does, we will continue to provide Ukraine with uh, what it needs. And we're uh, confident that uh, regardless of what we see, uh, the Ukrainian armed forces, the Ukrainian people uh, will be resilient. They will be committed uh, to winning back uh, their sovereignty, their independence, their territorial integrity. May I follow and up on this one, please? I know you just said that you got to be watching, but uh, do you have any red line that you would like to convey to Belarus? I'm asking because there are two warning signs. One is Putin today said that they're going to uh, they pledge closer cooperation to overcome Western sanctions. And secondly, um, Belarus opposition leader Tchaikovsky said that chances of Belarus sending troops into Ukraine will increase in the coming weeks. Well, we're going to continue watching very closely. Uh, and our concern has uh, always been that despite what we hear from President Putin, despite what we hear from uh, Lukashenko and his regime, uh, President Putin has uh, been able to use uh, Belarus as a launchpad uh, for his brutal war against Ukraine. 
mobilizing forces onto what should be sovereign Ukrainian territory, launching attacks from what should be sovereign Ukrainian territory into Belarus, uh, whether Belarus provides additional support uh, to Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, that's something we're going to pay very close attention to. And uh, if we see it, uh, if we see the potential for it, uh, we will respond appropriately uh, to impose additional measures uh, to hold the Lukashenko regime accountable for uh, what is essentially its complicity in President Putin's war against Ukraine. Can I ask a question on Jordan? Uh, let, let me take one question in the back from Christina, if you had not had a question yet. Yeah, um, the International Legal Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, Tanya Sanary, uh, called that said that conserving biodiversity and preventing pathogen spillover needs to go hand in hand in order to prevent the next pandemic. Did we maybe miss an opportunity to push China to join us in a resolution, calling for a resolution during COP15, um, calling for the elimination of pathogen spillover risk in order to make progress toward the goal of eliminating pandemics? I, I, I don't know that we would speak of a missed opportunity in the context of COP15 when COP15 resulted uh, in a, a really what is a, a tremendous success uh, and an ambitious target uh, for uh, the rest of the world or the world uh, by 2030 when it comes to biodiversity. Now, no one has ever expected uh, a single convention, a single gathering uh, to be a panacea. Uh, I think that is the case here. Uh, protecting biodiversity, including with other tools and tactics, uh, that will continue to be high on the agenda uh, of the department. I know our uh, special envoy, our assistant secretary for uh, our OES Bureau will remain engaged on this, and if there are ways that we can work with countries around the world, including the PRC, uh, to achieve that goal, uh, we won't hesitate to do so. Um, I, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask a quick question on Jordan, whether you have any comment on the legal violence that broke out in the last couple of days, and three security people were killed and so on. Are you in touch? I mean, Jordan is a close ally, and you coordinate a great deal on security matters, so do you have any comment on what is happening? As we do around the world, uh, we respect and we support the right of individuals to, to engage in peaceful protest. Uh, that is true uh, in Jordan. Uh, that is as true in Jordan as it is anywhere around the world. Of course, um, we condemn violence. Uh, we call for uh, uh, de-escalation, uh, but uh, the right of individuals to exercise their universal rights, uh, that is, in fact, uh, something we stand for universally. All right. Thank you. Thanks.